national politics in the Middle East, identifying the actors or the players and rules in a still dangerous world. The still is a reminder to us that Professor Brown first uh, wrote on this subject uh, in a book in 1984 in which the subtitle included the words dangerous world, hence still. Professor Brown is uh, the Garrett Professor in Foreign Relations, Princeton University Emeritus. He taught at Princeton from 1966 until 1993. He was director of their uh, interdisciplinary uh, Near Eastern Studies program during most, most of that period of time. He's authored uh, or co-authored or edited or co-edited or translated 13 books. They cover a variety of topics, all of which are central to the questions of the Middle East. There is a uh, area emphasis in a way in, in North Africa, Tunisia very early, and uh, the Ottoman Empire in terms of historical study and its impact on the, the region, but also the great questions of international politics and regional studies, modernization, the questions of the the, the heritage and change in the, the uh, Muslim world. He's written on Muslim statesmanship, and he's written on the Muslim approach to politics. And three of these 13 works that I referred to are specifically on international politics, including works on diplomacy and American diplomacy in particular. The topic, of course, is one that uh, challenges everyone now. None of us thinks that we're very well informed about the complexities of the region. We're very, very fortunate to have a almost lifelong student of the subject be with us tonight, the distinguished professor from Princeton University. It's my pleasure to present Professor L. Carl Brown. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I, having hearing aids and worrying about that and not being able to see you because of these Klieg lights, I guess you'll just have to yell out and with, uh, uh, speak up or perhaps just close your eyes and, and rest a little bit after a hard day's work, uh, as, as you wish. I'll do my best to talk right into the microphone and, and I hope I'm not overdoing it or pounding your ears. Quite obviously, I feel I should talk essentially, almost exclusively, about the events since 9-11 and on up through this miserable, traumatic situation we find ourselves in in Iraq right now. And there would be good justification for that, or I could certainly simply talk about the intensive American diplomatic involvement in the Middle East for well over a half century. I think it's, it's, it's important always to remind ourselves this is this being involved, for better or worse, in this area is nothing new. We got along for well over a century with only one doctrine, that of Monroe, and then suddenly we had three doctrines, presidential doctrines, all concerned with the Middle East. The Truman Doctrine of 1947, one decade later the Eisenhower Doctrine of 57, and the Carter Doctrine of 1980. We, we have other pronouncements. We st I think we're still a little bit uh, uh, in doubt about whether we're going to continue to use the word doctrine in talking about this or that initiative, but certainly we have a very uh, involved uh, uh, initiative going on right now in the Middle East. And again, I use the term for better or for worse. We could also remind ourselves of, of this is not the first uh, explicit uh, American intervention in, in the Middle East. We uh, saw, too, the overthrow of the government of Iran in 1953. Uh, I could mention other direct involvements right on up to the uh, first Gulf War of 1990-1991. I will try to be relevant to the situation we're in right now, but I propose instead to take something of a detour and talk a little bit about the, what I see as the general defining rules and background of this part of the world. Again, I think we always need to ask ourselves, we talk about the Middle East, let's define it, where is it? And of course, everyone has his own definition. I 
prefer to speak of the Middle East as including all 18 Arab states, that is, all states uh, members of the Arab League, plus two non-Arab states at the Arab League without getting my advice about the subject, uh, they in, invited in who aren't Arabs at all, Somalia and, and uh, Djibouti, and I just refuse to count them because they're not Arabs. But so there's 18 Arab states and three non-Arab states, uh, Iran, Israel, and Turkey that make, make up what I define as the, as the Middle East. That's worth reminding ourselves also that that Middle East has about 270 million a population in all of those Arab states, that is to say almost exactly the same population as our own United States. And adding Turkey, Iran, and Israel gives us just about another 100 million. So these, we're not talking about sort of sparse deserts with oases and like There's just a lot of folks out there, a lot of people. Now the Middle East, for purposes I'm going to talk about right here, is a little bit more narrowed down. Let's let's you define it as what is now Turkey, Israel, Iran, Egypt, the Fertile Crescent States, and the entire Arabian Peninsula. Now, what can we say about that area? Let me start with a, a, a personal reminiscence. In 1973, in September, I took my wife and three children on a sabbatical leave to Cairo, Egypt. Arrived September 1973. My late father-in-law took me aside when I was planning this trip and said, Carl, I'm just not sure that this is the sort of area you ought to be taking my grandchildren right now. I drew on all of my area experience and responded that I agreed the long run situation did not look very good, but I could assure him there would be no warfare for the nine months I expected to be there. Ten days later, the October Ramadan Yom Kippur War broke out. This is the experts you've invited to talk to you tonight. <laughs> I arrived in Egypt with the aspiration to do a study on a strictly Egyptian subject. Nothing to do about the outside world in the Middle East. I'd, I was kind of consumed with the, with the idea that we don't give the Middle East enough attention in its own right, and that too much so-called diplomatic history of this area tends to sort of, as it were, see the Middle East as a chessboard in which the players are, are the outsiders. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that. But then when that war broke out, and I realized that a head of state, e Egypt's Anwar Sadat, had taken such a risky gamble, not by, by starting war, not with the aspiration, not with the realistic or even unrealistic hope of defeating the enemy, Israel, but simply to trigger outside Western diplomatic intervention to get something done. I realize I can't run away from the way in which the Middle East and the West are just interlocked so, uh, so intimately in their ongoing politics and the like that you can't understand the one without the other. Or to put it more precisely, you can't really understand the broad lines of the, of the higher politics in the Middle East without bringing in that Western factor. And it was Sparked by that, that I began my work that, that uh, ended up in the book that was cited, International Politics in the Middle East, Old Rules, Dangerous Game, that appeared way back in 1984. And in that book, I believe that I could demonstrate that, there, that this is a distinctive area. I chose to refer to it as a diplomatic culture, a, a sort of a special way of, of engaging in dipl diplomacy and war that was, of course, at, at certain levels, just like everywhere else in the world, because you might say diplomacy and war everywhere has a certain generic common denominator, but there are certain differences. Let me sort of put it this way. It's to use the metaphor of sports, the metaphor of games theory, uh, 
it's sort of like a basketball team might, might choose zone defense or man-to-man. -man. It's the same game, the same rules, but different strategies, different ways of, of implementing them. And just some of the rules, because I'm certainly not going to uh, burden you with uh, a, a stripping down of, of my book. In fact, you can well imagine an author doesn't like to say it's possible to say essentially what's in a book in five minutes, so I'm not going <laughs> to try. The book is there in the library. You can have a look if you wish. I hope you will. It's out of print, alas. Uh, uh, but first and, f and foremost, this was this area that I've defined, and again, we're talking about essentially what is now Egypt, Turkey, Fertile Crescent, Arabian Peninsula, Iran, that core area. This area I defined as the most penetrated area in international diplomacy. And by penetrated, I meant just a, a sort of an interlocking of outside forces of all sort and regional forces uh, in a way that is distinctive. And that a certain number of, of, imp of important considerations flow from that. First, it's not that the people, the leaders in the Middle East, simply wish the outside world would leave them alone. It's not that simple. They solicit outside support. They also resist outside support, but they were just all so completely uh, tied up to, together. And, and that is, it seems to me, the main point. They expect outside support. They solicit outside support. They also resist it. Just a case in point. A leading uh, Ottoman statesman in the middle of the 19th century, Fuad Pasha, turned to the British ambassador one day. This was in the middle of these Ottoman efforts to somehow get strong enough militarily to stop the West from moving in, to also reform Ottoman institutions. That's something been going on a long time. This talk now about the, the Middle East, the Arab world must democratize, must sound very, would have sound very, very familiar to Fuad Pasha of, of, of the mid-19th century. He told the British ambassador, you know, our state, the Ottoman state, is the strongest state in the world. The British ambassador was rather shocked by this because this was the time in which the outside world was considering the Ottomans the sick man of Europe, you remember. Uh, he said, and I'll explain why because we are trying to tear it down from inside, you're trying to tear it down from outside, and still it doesn't fall down. Now, there's that sort of, you might say, sophisticated, cynical sense of being involved in it, of being caught up together. There are uh, other, other things that could be mentioned uh, I in passing. That, that sense of involvement, if I may just jump again to another personal point, I spent two years briefly, when I was briefly in the Foreign Service, I spent two years in Sudan. And one day at one of those ubiquitous uh, diplomatic parties, there was a young journalist from the Western Sudan, just a little bit east of the terrible situation taking place in Darfur now, in Kordofan. And I, one of my jobs in the embassy, uh, being the first part of the time the sole Arabist there, uh, was to read the local press. And a new, pay, a new newspaper had just uh, come out in Kordofan, which was violently anti-American. So I met this young man, and I took him to task for writing such nonsense, as I so diplomatically put it. Uh, and he smiled, and he said, we're a new paper. I'm looking for a subsidy. I had to explain that we'd run out of subsidies at the moment. Uh, we had some, too. That's another little point. Um, or Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, when asked why he didn't permit free press, he said, as soon as I permitted that, one paper would be in the pocket of the British and the Americans, one of the Russians, and one of the Chinese. And he said, I don't need that. So we have that kind of background. Another couple of more things quickly, and just what I see as the Eastern question psychology that grew out of this situation. I should back up and just say, uh, give me some, uh, let me give you some temporal dates. The Eastern question as a major diplomatic issue 
can be seen as beginning either in 1798, at the time Napoleon and 40,000 French troops landed in Egypt, or even a little bit earlier, 1773, when the Ottomans had been roundly defeated by Catherine the Great of, uh, of Russia. But the interesting point is from that time onward, the Middle Eastern state systems kept losing wars, losing diplomatic encounters, and slowly being picked to pieces to colonization, and fighting in the whole time a, a, a rear guard action. Now, in conventional uh, European diplomatic history, the Eastern question ends right after the First World War with the end of the Ottoman Empire and its survival, the Republic of Turkey and various uh, uh, successor states in the Arab world. In my judgment, if you can also talk about an Eastern question syndrome or an Eastern question paradigm or uh, rules of the game, that really uh, extend well beyond World War I, and to some extent they're with us uh, to this day. Now, uh, among other aspects of the way Middle Easterners uh, re re respond to diplomatic challenges, I've, I've, I've mentioned the uh, uh, awareness that the outsider is important, the often the soliciting of the, of the outsider, but then also trying to line up some other outsider to resist the unfriendly outsider. And <clears throat> another <coughs> very, uh, to, me, to my mind, fascinating point is Middle Easterners in their diplomatic bargaining, and this is both Arabs and Turks and Iranians and Israelis, it seems to me, uh, are disinclined to separate a, a, a negotiating situation into major points that are really very important and minor or peripheral points. They're also reluctant to, as it were, simply offer something on the, uh, on the negotiating table as a way of breaking the ice or getting things started. They're inclined to fight uh, tooth and nail over every jot and every tittle, over every little bit of, of, the, of the negotiation. Now, let's stop and, and tell ourselves there's nothing necessarily irrational about that. There's nothing necessarily more rational about our approach. It's often been said, and I think those of you in business or, or, or diplomacy or whatever would, would uh, uh, accept the basic logic of this, the American mentality in a negotiating situation, uh, moving toward a, uh, hoping to a solution, is that once you reach agreement on the major points, you see yourselves, as it were, as almost no longer enemies, but allies to work out the minor points to make the thing work. In the Middle East, I would argue, as a general rule, it doesn't work that way, and the negotiations continue over every little thing around the way. Now, so what? I would say that gives us some insight into the breakdown, the unfortunate breakdown of what was known as the Oslo process between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Because after that basic ag agreement on the basic principles, the hope and assumption was that with the passage of the time, the two parties, the Israelis and the Palestinians, would be a little bit more accustomed to each other, would see the common interest, would work on them, and they both cheated. Very uh, uh, understandable, you might say, in terms of, of, of their psychology, but, but un certainly very, very unfortunate. Now, uh, where does this leave us in terms of the present day situation? I've, I've, I've tried to present a situation of, well, I'm, really I should back up and make this clear. There's, I, I did mention there's 18 different Arab states, three other non-Arab states. I would see them as interacting not just with the West, not just with the United States, not just with Britain yesterday and the United States today, not just playing off the, uh, uh, the great powers uh, during the time of the, uh, of, the, of the Cold War, the U.S. And the, and the Soviet Union, but in a, in a dynamic relationship, working among themselves, fighting, contending, entering alliances, breaking alliances among themselves, 
dealing with the outside world in what I've called in my book a kaleidoscopic pattern in which like your, your child's kaleidoscope, you, you turn it a little bit and all of the little pieces of glass, the colored glass in the kaleidoscope change and, and give you a new shape, but they're all still involved one way or another. And there is that also that very important aspect of Middle Eastern uh, diplomacy, put so well by a very seasoned Arab d diplomat years back when he said, the trouble with the Middle East is everything is linked to everything else. Another aspect of this is the way in which the most, th there's not, not nearly as much uh, separation between what you might call very local issues, national issues, and international issues in this part of the world. They, they tend to get linked together. The way in which U.S. presidents have, mo have poured over maps of the Golan Heights or the way in which so much, so much of uh, M Middle Eastern negotiating between Israelis and, and Palestinians, and even before Israel between Zionist uh, Jews uh, 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 and Palestinians, over just the delineations of the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Temple Mount to the Jews and the like, right to this day. In fact, I've, I, years ago, I wanted to put together, I wanted to, try to write a play, believe it or not, about the 1929 uh, Wailing Wall incident. Because it is, it was, uh, I can't give you all the details here, but in a sense, it was such a tragic comedy, really. The way in which the two sides push comes to shove, a young man kicking a soccer ball over into, into a, a neighbor's house started the riot and so on, which started the massacre and, and, and all the rest. Fascinating, but just, just that small, just like a, 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 a breakdown in, in some portion of, 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 uh, of the city of Baltimore or something. But it had and it has international uh, 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 implications. I think it's important to remind ourselves how almost every major world leader has one way or another gotten himself involved in one aspect or another of the Middle Eastern situation. You can go back to Churchill right on up to President Bush today. And, and that too is another aspect of the uh, almost oppressive uh, uh, interface between uh, Middle Easterners and the outside world in a way that has its own logic but is not, I fear, all that healthy. Now, I wanted to say it's also important to keep in mind, and I, clearly I think we Americans need to always remind ourselves of this. I think it's, it's very deep in, in, in all human psychology to think sort of in binary terms. It's us and them, there's, there's only two parties. And the very essence of Middle Eastern diplomacy has been and continues to be multi-party. It's always more than just one us and one them. And it's very important, I think, uh, to keep that in mind. Let me just quickly sort of pass in review a few of the orientations of the different states in the, in the area. That was the purpose of the other book that, that I edited called Diplomacy in the Middle East, in which I was, I was trying to get uh, each contributor to zero in on just what are the basic uh, underlying assumptions about what we're up to, what we're doing uh, of this or that country uh, in the Middle East. And not surprisingly, you see some real interesting uh, differences. Take Egypt, for example. Egyptian leaders have aspirations to playing a role of regional leadership, and they are often quite frustrated when they find themselves uh, being blocked on that. Let's, remi let's remember that it's a long ago as the soon after the, as, uh, the, the Free Officers Revolution in, in Egypt in 1952, Nasser's little book, The Philosophy of the Revolution, spoke of the three circles of, of influence and importance, the Arab world, Africa, and the larger uh, Muslim world. Another thing that's a little bit uh, difficult to talk about without appearing to 
getting into cynicism and so on, but it's there, is the certain sense on the part of Egyptians and Egyptian leadership that a lot of these other Arab states are simply, as one Egyptian diplomat put it, simply tribes with flags. They're not real nations at all. And so there is that kind of uh, assumption. We tend to say, you know, Arabs are Arabs. We, we just sort of think in terms of a block. I remember that, uh, uh, that one of the times when I was uh, working in, in Cairo at the American University of Cairo at a time when Egypt was, the Egyptian army was very uh, caught up in Yemen trying to uh, support the Republican group against the uh, uh, Imam of Yemen and supported in turn by Saudi Arabia, another interesting example of the, uh, of the kind of ongoing uh, d diplomacy taking place in that part of the world. And I talked to the secretaries in the office, and they were just horror-stricken. They said, you know, our poor boys in, in Yemen, it's savage, that country. So there's that sort of sense of we are civilized and, and, and they aren't, uh, which, which is an important uh, consideration. And of course, when you find Saudis coming into uh, uh, Nile Hilton hotels in downtown Cairo and bringing out their charcoal brazier on the, on the balcony and roasting a, a sheep, you, you realize there is a certain uh, uh, mix up there. But uh, that's another thing. Uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, interesting enough, uh, 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 the, the, the Turks, in a sense, the Republic of Turkey was a clear break with the whole notion of a multinational, multicultural, multilingual uh, uh, empire, that of the Ottomans. But in another sense, the Turks almost uh, unthinkingly see themselves as the successors, as the imperial successors. Also, unlike so many of the Arabs, the Turks have a strong sense of uh, association with, of regard for, of being in, of, of embracing the state. Devlet Baba in Turkish, the Papa state almost, is, is a very important uh, uh, consideration. Uh, Israel, very interesting, as, as one very uh, sensitive Israeli uh, pointed out that uh, uh, Israelis tend to have a clearly illogical but deeply felt ambivalent but still deeply felt sense of we can whip all these guys if we have to and a sense of existential danger against the outside world of completely destroying us and they act within that framework they also uh, over the years having been boycotted uh, and, and pushed into the status almost as a pariah state by the surrounding Arabs uh, picked up, among other uh, diplomacies, the idea of leapfrogging over the Arab world to develop g uh, good relations elsewhere, uh, especially in, in Africa and Asia. That worked at one time beautifully and has kind of fallen apart in previous years. One could argue also that, uh, and many of my Israeli friends would, well, I think, perhaps challenge me on this, but I believe I can document it. One could argue that they have been rather reluctant to uh, make the generous gesture in victory to the defeated uh, Arab side. I remember uh, <coughs> at, uh, after the June 1967 war, which is of course uh, was a traumatic defeat for the, for the Arab neighboring, neighboring Arab states, uh, Moshe Dayan at the time said, uh, I'm waiting for the phone to ring. And I know in a public lecture I made at the time, why doesn't Dayan pick up the phone and dial a number? And I must admit, he's, he's no longer alive to challenge me. Abba Iban just read me the riot act, saying, no, you've got it all wrong, we did. Well, they didn't. It was, that's another very important aspect. Jordan is sort of the, sees itself, has, is seen by the outside as, as the black sheep, going back to the time in which uh, it was King Abdullah, the grandfather of the present king, who cut a deal with what was to become Israel uh, and was the only Arab side to come out with some territorial gain from, <coughs> from the 48-49 war and has never quite completely gotten over that, although over the very, very long tenure of the late uh, uh, King Hussein, I think to some extent 
uh, <clears throat> that uh, that posture has been uh, uh, has been changed. Uh, the Saudi government, very interesting, very interesting to th think that in the mid 1950s, when the United States was <clears throat> very concerned about Nasser and Nasserism, uh, President Eisenhower thought we should be supporting to the hilt as a counterweight to Nasserist Arab nationalism, uh, <clears throat> the Saudis, King Saud and the Saudis. That was such a misreading of the political reality. The Saudis, even to this day, uh, are in, in, engaged in, as it were, often in a rather crude way, buying off, paying off uh, p potential enemies. It's uh, some one scholar rather crudely put it: it's an Al Capone racket in which they're paying protection money, and there has been a lot of that, and there has been a a a, a reluctance to to come forward and take the initiative, and they do not have they do not perceive themselves as having the kind of strength to play uh, such a large role. One possible exception to this of uh, recently was Crown Prince Abdullah's very stimulating, very a uh, potentially useful initiative about getting all the Arab states to accept the existence of Israel and 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 move on toward a situation that might that come about might bring about a a resolution. Now, very quickly, all right. It's a distinctive cultural area. There's a lot to be said for there, but what relevance, if, if any, does what everything I've been saying have to do with the likes of Osama bin Laden? and Saddam Hussein and, and Iraq. I'm going to simply try my best to sum this up very quickly and leave time for your comments and, 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 and questions. But in a sense, as, as I see it, looking back at the roughly two centuries plus of Middle Eastern intertwining with the outside world, of the ambivalence that comes out of that, there has all along been a strong s feeling of, what's the best term? Almost of self-reproach for putting oneself in the position where you have such outside forces involving and, and dictating uh, to some extent, dictating your uh, your uh, your fate and future, while at the same time they are never sort of closing the door on keeping in touch with this or that uh, outside body. S certainly, as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, the fact that he is a Saudi and that he took very uh, seriously the. Uh, Saudi invitation to American troops to be brought in to defend Saudi Arabia against uh, Saddam Hussein invasion of Kuwait back in 1990 uh, was the breaking of ties uh, with the with the outside. Certainly, all along there has been, in a kind of an undercurrent, the perception, the you might say, the Muslim card, the, the perception of part and parcel of this of this outside involvement with us is at its root way anti-Islam. It has never bubbled up in quite the way that it bubbled up with bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. There are some modest, minor uh, precedents in, in the past, but uh, this is a, a distinctive case. There's, there's no doubt about it. But most important, it seems to me, is the interesting irony that the more an outside state is perceived as calling the shots, the more resistance to that very outside state. And it's somewhere along the line, if you look at the record to date, there has never been an outside state that has been able to exercise hegemony over the whole area. We, right now, have come closer than anyone. But in the coming closer, just look at the difficulty we are now confronting 
uh, in Iraq. And we need to ask ourselves, I mean, everybody thinks we know the answer, but why have all of the Arab, has all of the Arab world been so adamantly opposed to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein? And we can say, well, because very few Arab leaders, I, I, can, I can really hardly name a one, no Arab leader was happy with the existence of Saddam Hussein. But the sense of grievance on the part of all of us when the outsider gets involved and seems to be calling the shots, and especially going so far as a preemptive war, there's going to be a, a rallying around that is simply too, uh, uh, too visceral, too important to discount, overlook. It's going to be there. We should have known it, and, and we, we did not. Well, what's the answer? I think one, and here, if I upset anybody with what I have to say, uh, don't really lose any sleep over it, because what I have to say is not being seriously considered by anybody in power. <laughs> but in a sense, when I look at, a, at this distinctive area with its so many difficult uh, problems and potentials for uh, conflict and the like, and what it is, what's the basic minimal need that we have for that area, it is simply stability and access. One could also add, I think it's become, a, it's become a, we could say unwritten, but it's virtually a written American uh, uh, goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, the security and survival of the state of Israel. So those are the basic needs. And I think a strong argument can be made that most of those needs, for all practical purposes, all of those needs are either warmly embraced by the rest of the outside world or the rest of the outside world acquiesces in them. As far as access to the uh, energy resources, it's not just us who need it. It's the uh, Europeans to Japan, the uh, non-oil producing parts of the third world. They all have a need for uh, secure access to fossil fuels uh, in, in the Middle East. Accordingly, a strategy in which we, instead of taking the initiative and expressing our disdain, our dismay, our, our, our reluctance to go along with other states who won't do what they ought to do, we need to work and, and, and even risk the difficulties of building a coalition in order to avoid what uh, I think one of the most useful little concepts that the political scientists have, and economists have come up in with over the years is the so-called free rider syndrome in which there is a public good available to, needed by all, and only certain individuals working to secure that, and the others get a free ride. If, 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 if things go bad, it hurts the person who's sticking his neck out. If they go well, the other gets the free, the free ride, and that's the end of it. And so instead of thinking of, well, you know, it's old Europe, they're, they're just, they don't have their head screwed on right or something like that, uh, and while in no way discounting the difficulties of getting a group of states, just like any group of individuals, to take action and agree on anything along the way, still in terms of a basic posture, I think the need for the United States not to get out of the area, no, that's unrealistic, but not, uh, it goes against our own interest, but to lower the profile and to work toward lowering the profile in a way that, that makes us able to, uh, uh, as it were, overcome this dead weight of resistance to the outsider, and especially the outsider who's perceived as the more important uh, one calling the shots, and that's us now. I'll just end by saying, in my first visit to the Middle East, way back in 1953, I remember being struck, appalled, by the visceral hatred, 
and paranoid views that all of the young Arabs of my age that I was coming across had regarding Great Britain. Of course, we now knew, I, I even sensed it at the time, Britain was on the way out, we were coming up. But there it was. And that was, a, that was just a lodestone, that was just a liability that, that Britain had to fight with. We are living that liability right now. The final problem is, as with all great powers, your, the corrective mechanism forced upon you by your mistakes are not as quickly perceived. We are so strong, so great, we can keep doing things that are not to our interest uh, for a very long time. We might even achieve something for uh, something of a better Middle East. But on the route we're taking right now, <coughs> we will not have achieved a better Middle Eastern receptivity uh, to the United States. So I will stop there and invite your questions and, and comments. Thank you. Would you comment upon yes. uh, the possibility of uh, initially Israel having nice relations with a variety of third world countries, and there's been a, uh, a diminution of uh, success in that area. That's, that's a, a very good question. Let me try to uh, give it all to in quick an answer. But essentially, the, uh, the whole merging of a sense of third worldism, a sense of, of, of an, of an Afro-Asian bloc and the like, uh, in which there were clear perceived benefits for, uh, clearly perceived benefits, I'm not sure how much benefits came out of it, for that kind of combining together, uh, in which, of course, the, the Arab side was, what you've got to do is stop having these kinds of relations with the Israelis. I think that was the major uh, aspect of it. Although, in, in fairness, here, there, and elsewhere, this or that uh, Israeli equivalent of an AID program in African countries and so on, was was moderately successful, but not able to sustain to remain against that larger idea of a common Afro-Asian or even a common third world bloc for political purposes. Are, are we really hated all over the world, and if so, why? Yeah. Well, I think uh, nobody has a completely 100% affection for the preemptive number one. You know, whether it's the, the, the guy who has everything in the, cl in the, in the schoolyard or, or the big man on campus or whether, I mean, that is part, I mean, envy uh, uh, is, uh, is there. I remember uh, a wonderful uh, uh, Arab philosopher named Sadiq al Azam, a dear friend of mine, in a uh, conference once told, when I was talking to the members of the conference, he said, when I first heard about 9-11, he said, I just automatically said, serves them right. And he said, and then I kicked myself. I said, what is this? How can I say something like that? But I thought his very human honesty there was, was, was revealing and, and important. So the number one is always going to be envied, and it's going to be a real problem. And when the number one keeps, has his elbows out and all the rest, it makes it one heck of a lot worse. Speak softly, carry a big stick. Remember at least the first part of it. The, the question is, uh, um, there's a clash today apparently between a secularism, which has been pervasive, and there's a reaction uh, which is based on religion. Would you comment upon that? You, you mentioned uh, uh, Jannah, the Qaeda al Azam, the, the, the founder, in a sense, of the Islamic State of Pakistan, was, of, of course, you're absolutely right, a very secular man. I'm, I've always relished the story that he wanted to have a, uh, a, a ceremony inaugurating the independence of Pakistan serving champagne during Ramadan. His advisors had to <laughs> back him off from that. Uh, let's look at it this way. Uh, your, your Jinnahs, your Nasser's, your Ataturks, your Sukarno's, at an earlier period of time, 
these were not anti-religious figures, but figures who were, were certainly not caught up in this scriptural fundamentalism, be it Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or what Hindu, or what you wish. Uh, <clears throat> they were perceived as failing, <coughs> or certainly things were not going all that well in these societies, and one could see the move toward Islamism, or, or a political Islam, as a kind of a default option after others have failed. That's, that's one part of it. Another theme, which I think gets us into extremely uh, arcane issues, is the role of religious ideas and, and, and uh, uh, in society generally. How do, we, how do we explain the Reformation? We, we can try. We have, you know, certain things have been mentioned. There's the classic uh, uh, thesis of uh, Max Weber, the, uh, the, spot, the Protestant ec ethic and the spirit of capitalism in which so capitalism and, and reformation came hand in hand. That's been pretty badly mauled by later historians. How do we explain the, uh, the several revivalist movements in our country, which we may be in the process of going through another one, the, you know, the Great Awakening of the uh, 18th century and so on. There's no easy answer to these. I think we, the, 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 we, 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 the best we can do is, 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 is stick to uh, demonstrable facts and say this paints part of the picture, but it, it's, it, there's something missing. And the demonstrable facts are the perception that we Muslims are being manipulated and the like by them, by outsiders, a kind of a generalized perception, plus the perception that many of our own rulers are uh, unjust, they're not delivering the goods, they're just bad states, however you, uh, uh, you look at it, so you want to turn to something else. And there's kind of factor X uh, beyond that. You know, even, and I guess I'd stop at that. It's a, it's a uh, terribly important issue, but uh, I, just, I just don't want to say, hey, it's obvious why this, this happened. I, I think at the, the two points I mentioned are pretty good contributing fo causes. Uh, I do think man does not live by bread alone. I think you I mean you, you need an ideal, you, uh, and certain when certain ideals have been around don't uh, uh, fill the bill, some other ideal is going to come along. Uh, the the kind of Nasser, the kind of uh, ideal, the very quite quite secular ideal that that Nasser, among others, was representing at one time, uh, sort of came a cropper. I mean. The, Things didn't work out, and uh, years after him, uh, people were looking for something else. Yes, sir. Uh, when, and when, I think one very cynical but very perceptive historian pointed out, when things were going uh, badly during the Napoleonic Wars, the British upper class tended to go to church. Would you uh, yeah. comment upon the causes or motivations of terrorism from the Muslim world uh, across the world? Again, I'll just stick to the obvious things that I can document, that I can cite, uh, and, and stick with that very honestly nebulous answer to the previous question. And it's essentially, uh, there was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Pakistani, Saudi, American support of the Afghans uh, uh, to resist that invasion throughout the 1980s. This caught on in a way the Spanish Civil War did in the West, you know, in the 1930s. If this was something in which, uh, in which uh, uh, people, especially from the Arab world, came and fought and, and, and uh, uh, ultimately succeeded. Uh, tying in to that was the perception of uh, 
the outside world and especially the, the United States uh, leaving Afghanistan. Uh, we, we Muslim radicals won in Afghanistan by the end of the decade and it, with a great sense of empowerment uh, coming out of that, going back to their various, country, their various countries of origin, often being uh, locked up or persecuted or going underground very soon thereafter, finding not totally incorrectly that the, these governments were, were uh, unjust. They were uh, uh, more or less, as they saw it, in the pockets of the, of the, of the outside world, especially uh, the United States. Uh, the Saudis had permitted uh, infidel troops to come even to the Holy Land of, of Arabia. All of these things coming together has created a, a momentum uh, which, is, uh, which is awesome. Now, that said, I, I think uh, I don't want to in any way uh, discount the, the, the importance of these, these movements, and they are certainly not, they are not kept alive by money. We like it or not, these are, uh, it's, I, mean, I just love life so much, I cannot easily understand you're a suicide bomber unless there's just a very, very intense uh, superhuman kind of motivation going on there. And that's what we're up against, and that's not easy. But it's there. From Mohammed Atta, who was one of those going into the World Trade uh, uh, Towers, uh, right on down to those who we still can't locate. So is it just revenge, or is there a goal? I think uh, there is a perceived uh, goal. Uh, it strikes, all, should rightly strike all of us as, as uh, wow, but then when you're talking about fanatical groups throughout history, they often come up with extremely uh, otherworldly, unrealistic goals. And I, just, I think their, their, their goal is more or less as stated. I, I read very carefully what bin Laden and Zawahiri and and the earlier Ahmed Rassam have to say, and they, they, they believe that there is a possibility, if they uh, stay the course, that uh, the United States and the West will at least pull out of the Middle East, or this or that Muslim government will fall, Saudi Arabia being perhaps the major candidate, and then there could be a snowball, you can't say snowball in Arabia, but there'd be a, a, a bandwagon effect. Uh, 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 throughout the, the area. Wow, yes, but uh, when, you're, when you're looking at these almost uh, apocalyptic type movements, which we've gotten into now, uh, they believe it. How realistic is democratization in the Middle East? Again, let me just draw on my two centuries study. It is uh, ominous and ironic the way in which the West has always, over these last two centuries, been involved in changing the Middle East, making the Middle East do the right thing, according to us. Uh, it's important to remember Thomas Carlyle's The Unspeakable Turk, uh, William Gladstone, The Turks Must Get Out of Europe, Bag and Baggage or even that lovely put down in uh, Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers. Well, it's over and done with, as they always say in Turkey when they cut the wrong man's head off. <laughs> uh, the interesting, uh, you know, I've wrestled with this a lot. After all, I've, 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 I can't completely dissociate myself from Wilsonianism, teaching at Princeton University. Uh, but the more I look at it, the more disinclined I am to, uh, to have any outside power try to induce, encourage, or dictate uh, the, the, the basic uh, rules of political, social organization in other parts of the world. Then as soon as I say that, I, I go back and I look at things like the British anti-slavery movement throughout the 19th century which was a wonderful thing. And if we'd all just said, let's just, uh, you know, uh, 
it's crazy that people, some people want to enslave others, but it's their business, not ours. That, that's what we would have been, still been stuck with, perhaps. Uh, this gets into the whole concept, which I think uh, I had it in my notes and I was, as always, overrunning my time. The whole notion of humanitarian intervention and wrapped with that the notion of to what extent is the, whole, is the units of international life, the state, as opposed to something other than the state, or to what, it, I mean, to, is, is the sovereign state all of that uh, sacrosanct? Should it be all that sacrosanct? Should we, defining we uh, any way you want to, accept the obligation, and perhaps even the right, to tell the Saudis, let women drive cars. Let them drive Hummers if they want to. Uh, they got enough oil. Uh, <laughs> unlike us, yeah. Uh, but uh, so somewhere along the line, there, uh, it, uh, I, I think we do want to strike a balance against simply saying or having a foreign policy that implicitly says we don't care what you do within your borders, provided our basic material interests are taken care of. I think we have a certain interest and concern. To, to try to foster uh, better uh, betterment. That said, as I look at the United States and the Middle East today, the last entity to be bringing these wonderful goodies to the Middle East is the United States. Uh, it hurts me to say that, but I think that's very, very true. I know I rained on a picnic of a, of a of a Y River meeting a couple of years back in which State and Defense Department and other people getting together about how shall we dem democratize the Middle East on a budget that won't even buy one, uh, anything like one day's combat uh, equipment uh, in Iraq. Um, and I told them don't bother. And they said, I won't be invited back as a uh, keynote speaker for the, for the follow up. But I, I'm serious about that. It come, if, it, if it comes with a Made in America label, it's already uh, uh, halfway uh, default. Let me apologize to Mr. Savage and, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Burnett and others who still had questions. Our, our time has passed to end the session. Uh, we're indeed, we're absolutely delighted with our evening. We thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.